Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. Two years ago this month, a massive earthquake decimated Haiti, literally. More than 200,000 people were killed, one out of every 10 men, women, and children living on the island. The destruction left one and a half million people homeless. Thousands of relief agencies began working with Haitians to help the survivors get food and shelter and bury the dead and start rebuilding. Donors sent in about $1.8 billion in aid to Haiti through U.S. charities, but half of a million people are still living in makeshift camps. Eight million people have no electricity, and 70% of the people are either unemployed or underemployed. To get an insider's look at the progress of recovery and the challenges still ahead, we'll talk with two journalists who have traveled repeatedly to Haiti. National Public Radio correspondent Jason Bobian and BBC correspondent Laura Trevelyan both began reporting from the deeply impoverished country before the earthquake. They covered the disaster and have returned periodically. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, you both said in your anniversary report that the scars from the earthquake are both mental and physical. Let's start with the land and the buildings. Uh, Jason, when you uh, tell us how you got into Haiti and what it looked like when you got there. So I was actually in Mexico City, I'm based out of Mexico City, and when the earthquake hit, you know, we were getting reports, and it was really not that clear how bad this really was. Is it as bad as people seem to be making out? But I, I flew to Miami from here, um, so the quake was in the afternoon, around, right around 5 o'clock. The next morning, caught the first flight to Miami, and then it was the airport was closed in, in Port-au-Prince. We are trying to figure out how to get there. Uh, it, turned out a photographer and I flew to Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic, and we rented an SUV and, and drove in. And it was actually quite interesting driving in because the Dominican Republic had also felt the quake, but you weren't seeing that much damage there. And then you crossed the border, and you were starting seeing more damage in Haiti. Um, and then the closer you got to the heart of Port-au-Prince, the worse things got. The more buildings that were collapsed, um, there was sort of dust everywhere. Um, you know, there was no electricity. The phones weren't really working. There were tons of people out in the street. Um, there was rubble out in the streets of buildings that had collapsed into the street. It was really chaotic when we first first got there. You know, people were worried about getting food, getting gasoline. There were um, you know, people were rummaging through stores and just ripping out whatever they could. Um, it, it was very chaotic. Um, and, and there was, I just remember this dust that was covering everything. The cement blocks had just sort of pulverized. They'd just completely fallen apart in the, in the quake, and, and that had caused this, this cloud of dust that, that initially went up over the city, and by the time I got there, had sort of settled over everything. Right. And, Laura, you arrived uh, uh, shortly after the earthquake struck. Uh, what, what were your impressions? Well, my impressions were just of the rubble, everywhere. I was actually there in the April after the earthquake, so three months after, on a visit with Michelle Obama, in fact. And it was just extraordinary how it meant 12 weeks after, just how chaotic it was, how disorganized, and just also this overwhelming sense of grief, because hundreds of thousands of people had lost relatives, bodies were still being pulled from the rubble then. And it was just this sense of a, a hugely traumatic event in a society which uh, had already endured years of political violence and also other natural disasters, like, for example, hurricanes and tropical storms. Right. We'd, we'd like to uh, share some excerpts from your broadcasts. Uh, both of you aired on the second anniversary of the earthquake. Here's Jason's vivid recounting. As a reporter, some quotes get burned into your mind. There isn't a family in Haiti that isn't crying right now, a woman told me in English. Maybe those words stuck with me because I'd been crying myself. That morning, my translator and I had been standing on a field of earthquake debris talking to an old woman. Tears streaked all of our faces as the woman recounted how the walls of her house had started to wobble and how her grandchildren didn't get out. And then there were the bodies, piles of bodies, stacked like cordwood beside the road, dumped at the moor, burned in the streets, shoveled with front-end loaders into trucks and dropped into mass graves at an old gravel pit just outside the city. 
Some of the men clearing debris could have been zombies, ghosts who'd wormed their way up to the surface. They were everywhere, stoically pounding away with sledgehammers at what looked like insurmountable piles of rubble. Now, Jason also shared the story of a woman who was still grieving for lost relatives and still living in a temporary shelter. For the last two years, Gerline Rousseau has been sharing a canvas tent with her three brothers and her seven-year-old son. She says this camp is hell. It's been really, really tough out here in this hot sun. In the daytime, we cannot stay inside our tents because it's so hot. When we go out to try and find some shade, thieves come with razors and steal our valuables. And at night, I can't sleep because I'm afraid of robbers. Rousseau is 22 years old, but looks far older. Like most of the thousands of other residents of this camp, she bathes in the street by pouring water over herself from a basin. She says people are living here like pigs. Two years ago, Rousseau didn't just lose her home in the quake, she lost both her parents. The worst thing is that if my parents were still alive, I wouldn't be here. And Laura, you provided a... a several of these harrowing accounts, uh, personal accounts of, of victims, and you uh, provided a uh, before and after account of a public park that was turned into an encampment for the homeless and was recently returned to normal with kids playing and the temporary residents now living in a permanent structure. You also interviewed a woman who's been living in a crime-ridden camp outside Port-au-Prince for two years, fearing for her safety every night and still unable to find a job. And you challenged President Michel Martelli about the pace of relocation. Here's an excerpt from your interview with the president. The scars of the earthquake are mental and physical. Half of the rubble has now been cleared. The rest is in telltale piles. And half a million people who lost their homes are still living in tents. Haiti's president, Michel Martelly, says that's changing. We were slow to move the people out of the camp. And lately, we've been able to do it and uh, I can say that it's a huge step. I'm standing in Place Boyer in Port-au-Prince. This was a sea of tents after the earthquake. But in the last month or so, everybody has been moved out. And now, children are playing, people are sitting on the benches. Life has returned to some kind of normality. You both have talked about how disasters in Haiti seem to come in bunches. and. For the, uh, for the past year, Haiti has been dealing with a cholera, cholera epidemic uh, that may have been introduced by UN peacekeepers, and the epidemic spread across the entire island, uh, sickening half a million people and killing thousands. Have, have uh, either of you suffered illnesses uh, during your assignments in Haiti? I've just gotten bad stomach bugs, but it wasn't actually cholera. Um, when, I, when I've been there, and I mean, I take malaria medication. It's one of the few places that I still take malaria medication when I go. Um, but yeah, I'm fairly fairly cautious. I actually used to eat before the cholera outbreak. I, I love the the beans and rice that they sell um, from these little street stalls. Uh, but I, I no longer do that. I only sort of eat in hotels and, and in restaurants. It's it's a little bit of a a drag. How cautious you have to have to be now, but that's that's what I do because you know, you really don't want to get hit with that. Yeah, I, I've never been ill there, right. um, but I think when you're staying there as a foreigner, you are very fortunate because you know you're staying in a hotel, you have running water, and only 17% of patients actually have toilets. So w when you're going there, you're in a, a pretty privileged position. You can choose what you eat, um, and you can choose where you eat and, and where you stay. So if you're if you're careful, certainly I've always been fine. Yeah, and Laura, you spoke with Paul Farmer, a uh, uh, a physician and humanitarian who founded Partners in Health and was the subject of Tracy Kidder's uh, best-selling book Mountains Beyond Mountains, that featured his work in Haiti. Uh, Farmer called Haiti the most water insecure place in the world and said it's no surprise that the cholera epidemic exploded. I was inspired when, when I read about Farmer's achievements and his self-sacrifice. And I'm always inspired when journalists like you and Jason put your health and well-being at risk to report from these disaster zones. Laura, what do you tell your loved ones when they ask you why you're 
volunteering for these heart-wrenching assignments? Well, I have three children who are smallish. I mean, they're 11, 9, and 5. And um, I have a husband who's uh, he's actually a network television news executive here in New York for ABC. And he, we always have discussions about these kinds of trips because his view is, as somebody who deploys reporters, that uh, you know there are very perverse incentives for reporters when they go somewhere which... I mean, I wouldn't say that Haiti was dangerous exactly. It's more that the, the story is so heart-wrenching. But with that extreme need is, is often, you know, you do see, but, and I'm sure Jason has too, I saw real violence in those camps, you know, people pulling guns on one another at six in the morning. But anyway, my husband's point is that there are perverse incentives for reporters in anywhere that is remotely dangerous because having gone there, you want to do something which is worthwhile and therefore you're more likely to take a risk. <clears throat> so we always have a conversation about right. what is an acceptable level of risk. And, and you mentioned uh, that the about the disconnect um, between the luxury journalist, luxury that journalists experience, and the compare with the, the uh, deprivation of Haitians, and the, uh, the that the hotel is a good place to kind of show that difference. Yeah, and I that, I find that is is a disturbing disconnect really that you go down and you report on the conditions that people are living in and then yours are, are so different and you know you look around and you see that that's also true of many people who are working for aid agencies and it's just one of the many paradoxes really and I was very struck by it during the cholera epidemic because we were staying that was um, in the San Mark in the Otabinit region and we were actually staying in what was a a beach resort that was used for, you know, at one point American diplomats had been based there. And that was such a contrast, you know, with the horror of the hospital where people were dying of cholera. And then this beach resort where we were staying. And Jason, before becoming uh, NPR's man in Mexico, you worked for four years in Africa reporting on the poverty on the world's poorest continent. Is it in, in these these assignments? Are you also f struck by uh, this, these the conflicted feelings of living well while these people are starving and in horrible conditions? Well, I really do get that out of Haiti more than anywhere else I think I've ever been. Um, you know, working in Africa, you you would often be staying in, uh, you know, at times just some, you know, on a mat somewhere, uh, you know, you're covering a story um, out in Darfur, you could just be sleeping in, um, you know, a back room somewhere. Uh, if you did get to a hotel, it probably wasn't very nice at all. Haiti is very different than that, and it's really uh, striking how there's these really very nice hotels. You know, the, the Hotel Montana is, is quite nice. There's, um, you know, they, they aren't super nice, but they're, they're very comfortable. And there's also restaurants that you can easily spend, you know, $40, $50 on an entree up in Petionville. Uh, there's this incredible um, contrast in Haiti um, between people who have absolutely nothing, don't even have access to clean water, and, and people who are driving Porsches through streets that I don't know why anyone would want to drive a Porsche on those roads. They're so terrible, uh, but people are doing that. Um, so Haiti really brings home this this contrast between um, the rich and poor. Um, I, I I didn't find you know there are some incredibly wealthy um, people in Africa uh, in some of these countries, but they they don't flaunt uh, the the wealth as much. And there's also not as large of a, a, a sort of business and an upper class uh, in, in some of these African nations. You're, you're seeing a, a poverty that that extends much more broadly across the entire population. What, uh, uh, Jason and then Laura, what, what are some of the uh, logistical and practical challenges that you've uh, faced while reporting in Haiti? Well, I mean, initially going in for the earthquake, we, we really did not know what the situation was going to be like there. We, we you know, got into Santo Domingo. Um, we rented a, a big SUV, a Nissan Patrol. Uh, we were loading it up with diesel fuel, with food. Um, we were 
getting in touch with people via satellite phone who, who were actually in. Some people were saying, well, you better bring some body armor. It looks like um, you know, this could be civil unrest. We didn't know what exactly we were going to need. We didn't know if there was going to be anywhere to stay. Uh, we were expecting, this photographer and I, that we were going to be sleeping in this SUV. Um, so we were sort of stocking up on and everything that we could. And when we got there, we actually were, were able to go to the, the Hotel Villa Creole, where we had um, stayed before the quake. And part of that that hotel had, had fallen in. and it, would, would, it hadn't completely fallen over, but it, you, know, it was, you could not go into a good section of the hotel. But many people were sleeping just around the pool, sleeping in the sort of the grass there. Um, yet the challenges were... Um, just immense. We, 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 you know, had to take care of just our own survival as well as, uh, as, as figuring out how we we're going to get out and report. So yeah, that was a, a real logistical challenge. And you know, we were able to work it out once we got there. The, the hotel actually did an amazing job of managing to, to come up with some sort of food every day. It was often very limited, but they managed to. They they got a big grill going and they started um, just <laughs> cooking a lot of the stuff. I think they had in their freezers. Um, but there would be, you know, there would be some food each day, um, and so and we, we we were not starving, and we had brought enough water, and we brought, um, you know, tablets to to clean water if we needed to. And Laura, what about uh, your challenges? Anything that stick out? Yeah, I mean, you know, working with a television crew, sometimes you need to have a security guard as well as a driver, maybe two drivers, if um, depending on what you're doing, and a fixer, an interpreter. So. Yeah, there are, you know, you, I guess you just, you have to be careful. Just at the weekend, I was in this camp, which was particularly crime-ridden, and we went there early in the morning to do some interviews. And, and as we got there, the UN police who patrol that camp said, you know, two cameras like yours have been stolen in the last week. This really is not a good idea, what you're doing, just trying to wander around and talk to people. Right. And and I said, well, you know, we have our, our own security guard and... And they said, well, if you're going to be here, we're going to escort you. So that rather strange situation developed where we were doing interviews with, you know, 15 UN policemen, all with gum around us. But, and I was worried that this would make a difference and that no one would want to talk to us, but everybody did anyway. They just were used to the UN being there. But it was a, a strange sort of a setup. And Jason, you, you mentioned uh, before the show that Haiti is somewhat... Uh overrun with media, actually, and that, that can cause problems. Can you talk a bit about that? And Laura, chime in if you have any uh, comments on that. Well, something that I've just noticed, you know, covering Haiti since the quake, that I, I found that lately it's become harder to really connect with people in the camps. I, I think there's so much frustration in the camps. Uh, they see so many journalists come through, so many aid workers come through, and I think a lot of people feel like um, they've are just being used. They, they, people. Some people are hostile in a way that you. I wasn't feeling hostility, you know, a year ago. Um, other people, you know, just wanted money. They wanted money to tell a story. Um, it, I found that the, the atmosphere in the camps towards journalists had sort of deteriorated in a way that made it really hard to just sit down with people and and really connect with them in a way that I felt like I'd been able to earlier. And I felt like I had to go around more and I had to go talk to, to more people, um, yeah, to really get interviews that that um, felt real to me, that didn't feel, feel like someone was just recounting the same story um, or, or was trying to tell me a story because they, they hoped that, you know, we were going to give them something or give them some money or that this would um, lead to them being able to get to a a different camp or a different, a better, um, you know, some of the camps have actual houses, plywood type houses. Um, so people are hoping to get into things like that. So I, I feel like it, it's become, become harder just to connect with people. Right. And I think it's interesting what Jason's saying, because I noticed a lot of people this time saying, you know, what difference is it going to make to me, you coming here and, and filming, you know, you're all you're making money, you've got jobs by filming us, and, and how is it going to change our lives? So, which I think speaks to the sense of people who are still in the camps after two years of increasing frustration. Okay, I'd like to talk next about uh, kind of a foreign aid accounting and 
the pace of reconstruction. But before we continue, I want to remind everyone that you can view or listen to this program anytime by downloading our podcasts at globaljournalist.org. You can also find interesting articles, photos, and interviews related to today's program on our website. Please send us questions or comments via globaljournalist at kbia.org or our Facebook page. The um, what's uh, Jason, what are the homeless Haitians saying about the use of foreign aid? And if they're angry, where is it directed? Oh, I mean, they're just astounded by what has not happened. I mean, they heard that billions of dollars were being pledged to Haiti. And, you know, it's not just them. I look around and go, where did that money go? You know, you look around Haiti now, and they've cleaned up a lot of the rubble. There's not rubble blocking the streets. You don't see, like, some huge building that's about to topple over most of the time. You can be driving around and still see some buildings that are are like that. And you definitely see the effects of the quake everywhere, but you don't see sort of dangerous bits of uh, walls that are about to to fall over. Um, But in terms of big, massive, uh, new things that have been built as a result of this aid money, you don't see it. And the people in the camps don't see it either. And they keep saying, look, I don't even have a job. I don't have anything. You know, I've got a tarp. I've got a tarp and maybe a couple of plastic buckets. And um, people were pledging billions of dollars to us. There's an incredible level of frustration um, with, with that. You know, that's it. You have to give the aid groups – um, their due and say that it is amazing that they they provided health care, um, they provided those tarps, they provided those buckets, um, but in, it's really you don't see sort of shining examples, um, except I have to say, I went out to Paul Farmer's new hospital that they're building out in the Central Plateau. This thing is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, they spent $16 million to build a first class, you know, a world class hospital. It's not done yet. Um, but for 16 or $20 million, they're going to be giving the Haitians a, a really amazing, large hospital that's going to be the best hospital in the country. Um, that is impressive for that amount of money. But you don't see very many examples like that uh, as you look around Haiti right now. Right. And uh, Laura, uh, you reported that concerns about corruption in, in Haiti led governments to pledge the money with multiple strings attached, and there's also been calls for non-governmental organizations, NGOs, to do a better job accounting for their funds. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on what people are saying in, in the process? Well, what struck me this time was how much energy there is with the new government of President uh, Michel Motteli compared to being there previously with the government of President Preval. And President Martelly has appointed a Prime Minister, Gary Kneel, who has a background with the UN and also worked with Bill Clinton. And Gary Kneel in particular is somebody that governments seem to trust, that aid agencies want to work with, and, uh, and if Haiti's parliament will continue to work with him, you can see finally an opportunity for all this money that has been pledged, and only half of what was pledged has actually been spent, for the rest of it to be released. And, I, you know, I had a sense that there was movement and uh, this new government has moved, well, is in the process of moving 5,000 families out of the camps. Of course, it's just a drop in the ocean, but it, it is a beginning. And while I was there, the Canadian government pledged $20 million to move people out of this uh, camp, Champ de which is right opposite the ruined presidential palace and is a real symbol of the earthquake's devastation. So... I had a feeling that for all the difficulties, this is a government that is determined to try to move forward. Jason, has the political instability that seems to always be there in Haiti, has that affected how this process has been working? And uh, is the president more of a cheerleader, or uh, does he have the skills to uh, help get his country rebuilt? Definitely. I mean, the political instability there has been a problem for a long time, even before the quake. But, you know, I I definitely agree with with Laura. I felt on this last trip there, right around the the second anniversary of the quake, that things are finally moving in the right direction um, and that Martelli's government is attempting to to move things in the right direction and that that you're actually seeing some of that movement. So I I completely agree with her on that, that it it feels like things are 
are, are on the right track. Uh, you know, the Mark Kelly getting into office caused a lot of instability. You know, the, the, his election was controversial. There were riots around around those elections. Um, you know, Praval um, also just sort of stalled. He didn't really come out and make any bold moves. Um, so it, there definitely needed to be a transition to somebody else. And, and Martelli is, as, as you say, a cheerleader. But I think Haiti kind of needs a cheerleader right now. There are a lot of people who are very depressed, who are uh, frustrated, who want somebody to be out there saying, look, we can succeed, we can move forward, we can get these things done. Um, and I'm not, not talking about just Haitians, I'm talking about also aid organizations, um, groups that have money to, to give. Um, they want to know that, that these projects are going to be successful. And by having Martelli out there saying, look, we can do this, we can get this done, um, I think it sets the right tone. And, and you know, I, I think that uh, after two years of, of things moving fairly slowly, um, I think that Martelli is poised to actually make some progress. Laura, what are you, you had an extensive interview with, with uh, the new president. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I was just struck by him uh, about how he's very charismatic. You know, as a, as a compass singer in Haiti, he has you know, he seemed to be wildly popular, particularly with young men that I encountered. So he has that, you know, a real populist flair and also this, this sense of energy. I mean, behind the scenes, some people that I spoke to were also questioning whether he would turn out to be, you know, another authoritarian leader in particular his proposal to revive Haiti's army, which was disbanded in 1995 after, you know, all the coups and, and the associations with the Duvalier de, de years. But uh, Martelli has proposed reviving the army, pointing out that why should Haiti have what is in effect a foreign army? At the moment, it has UN peacekeepers that provide uh, security around its borders. Uh, but there has been anxiety among some donor governments who think that really restoring the army shouldn't be the priority. Uh, and they feel it revives the ghosts of Haiti's past. Yes. Speaking of uh, speaking of ghosts and, and and being haunted, Jason, you began your broadcast uh, on the two re two year anniversary by saying that Haiti quote makes you believe in spirits in resurrection. Why? I think in part because when you talk to Haitians, many of them believe very strongly that there are spirits around and that. Um, Ghosts are out there, and an event that that killed, you know, nobody knows exactly the number, but more than two hundred thousand people, um, like that causes a lot of ghosts. And Haitians, you know, really, I believe in this stuff. You go to the churches; that they're talking about it in the in the pews. They're talking about the spirits, and um, and it, it, it's very much a place that is linked uh, that linked to that. Okay, and, I think um, I'm sorry, Jason. We have to wrap it up, but. It's been a fascinating uh, conversation, and we've come to the end of the program. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Our director is Travis McMillan. Pat Akers engineered the audio. Raymond Tungakar is our executive producer, with Ryan Chris as our lead producer. For Global Journalist, I'm David Reed. Thank you for joining our program.